It is in your presence that we stand tonight. Who is this God? The righteous one. When your word in Isaiah says your ways are not our ways, your thoughts are not our thoughts. Even our cleverest thoughts in life, Lord, doesn't even match. As far as the heavens is as distant from the earth, so are my ways greater than yours, says the Lord. Church, God is God of love. He's the God of grace. But there's nothing that describes our God more than who He is. Our God is holy. Holiness cannot stand in the presence of God. No matter how smart you think you are, no matter who you are, you can never stand in the presence of a king, our God. Because holiness and flesh cannot communicate. When Moses was speaking to God, God passed by him. He said, show me your glory. And God had to hide Moses in the cleft of a rock when he just passed by him. Because holiness had passed by Moses. When Moses came down off that mountaintop, he was glowing purely from the presence of a holy God. One day, we shall see you face to face. When your word in Revelation says to us, Lord, that every day the angels bow down and they sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Because Father... It's all inspiring to be in the presence of such an awesome God. Tonight we are privileged through the Holy Spirit to have a moment of that time in this corporate gathering tonight. Come and talk to us through your word, Lord. Thank you for your presence. We ask it in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. We just want to welcome the MAWC Members that have visited our church tonight, amen. So good to have you guys with us. It's our great privilege and honor. And may I just say, this is the Bikers Church. This is not our church. This is the, this is your Kerkiri. So please abuse it. <laughs> hello, hello. Can I just see by show of hands, how many of the MAWC bike clubs are visiting us tonight? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Well done, man. So good to have you guys here. So, uh, so this sermon will be on YouTube from about tomorrow afternoon after 3 o'clock or on Facebook on our Bikers Church page. So do yourself a favor, take this sermon and send it to all those naughty oaks that said they were coming and they didn't come. Amen. Amen. But I can tell you this, that God has an appointment with everybody that's here tonight. Whether you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior or you... Do not know him. Tonight is our appointment with our heavenly daddy. So I, I, I got this thought in my mind some time ago to, to share this word. And, and I, the word that came up in my heart when I was thinking of what do I share. And, and the word repentance came into my mind. And I thought to myself, well, what can you actually, how much can you actually say about repentance? Well, brace yourself. Are eh? we going to be here until about, I was 10. <laughs> no. Any kidding? Don't leave now. Don't leave. Sit, relax, relax. It's not true. But I want to share with you something that is so profound and so important. And can I say this? The word repentance is on God's heart for us. It is on God's heart for us. God wants us to live a life of repentance. So here's an issue about repentance. Now listen to this. Admitting sins is no substitute for quitting sins. <laughs> so may that be the theme of what I'm going to talk about tonight. You see, if I asked anybody here tonight, you'd probably be bold enough to say to me, hey, Pastor, I, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I sin a lot. I do. Every one of us, listen, even the smoothest of the smoothier, sin. We say it, we speak it, we look it, we think it. On corruption, sometimes you can't believe you can go down those alleys. It's a fact. But you see, admitting sins is never a substitute for quitting them. God wants us to deal with those sins. That's called repentance. That's how we deal with those issues in our life. 
So we see a, a, an event taking place, and I want to start off from here because this is so profound the way it works. He has the disciples after Jesus was taken, he was crucified, and, and he was buried, and then on the third day he rose again. Who knows? Jesus is alive right now. And, and that is why we, we love him and we serve him. And Paul rightly said, if there was no resurrection, well, we're wasting our time. We may as go and plant mealies or something or whatever floats your boat. But because Jesus is alive and he's changed our hearts, we know that he's alive. So, so he has this Bangbrook disciples in the upper room, about 120 of them, scared because if these dudes got a hold of them, the Romans and, and some of the religious Jewish people, they would have crucified these oaks in the same kind of manner. So they're not into that kind of stuff, you know what I'm saying? It's okay for Jesus, not just not us. And then in the upper room, in, in Acts 2, the chapter starts off with, and then God poured down the Holy Spirit and it came upon all flesh and they begin to speak in tongues, these guys. And everybody was listening to this and there was this incredible move of the Spirit of God. And, and let me say, that was the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ. And of course, Peter comes outside because these people think, hey, that's a chasepia. You know the bikers carry on when they have had a one too many, you know that noise they make. They thought they were track these oaks, and they said to him, what is going on? And yet the same Peter that was Bangbrook Peter is no Longbrook Peter. And he comes out, and he begins to speak to these people. And he begins to tell them that it was you guys that dis regarded this Jesus that walked here with us. It was you guys that put him on the cross. It was you guys that got him buried. But I'm telling you today, he's risen and he did it for you. And then the Bible says something so fascinating. He says, and when the people heard it, they were touched in their hearts because they realized something supernatural had taken place. And so we pick up the story when they ask Peter, what must we do? He has the answer. This answer is not only for what Peter said then. This answer is fresh, out the oven, smells like a lekker gebakte, whatever, that floats your boat. Lekker brood. So duck snakes, so the scops, met bio water and peanut butter and syrup. <laughs> or jam, or whatever. So, no honger, want ek het nou daar gedink. So, so here comes Peter and he answers this. This universal answer is, is relevant today. In, when you hear it, it is for you and I tonight. He says this. Peter replied, Acts 2, 38. Each of you, notice this, not one of those that were listening to him were exempt. I want to say this to you tonight. There's nobody sitting here that's not exempt from hearing what you're going to hear now. Amen. He's talking to all of us. He says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice what he says here. We need to repent of our sins and turn to God. That's what he says. And then be baptized. That little hockey over there is our baptism bath because it's biblical to put people under the water. Some people, I want to baptize them and then keep them there <laughs> because I've seen when they come out of there, they... Still the same as they went in there. But, but that's what our baptism bath is here for. It's not the churches. That's God's place. Amen. Uniquely positioned below the cross. But the point of the matter is, yeah, Peter stands up and probably a 15-minute, 10-minute sermon, he preaches to these guys. And let me tell you, 3,000 people get saved from that one message. So I'm trying to shorten my sermons. <laughs> But Acts 2 verse 41, a little bit further on, Peter's still speaking, and he says this, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day what is about 3,000 in all. Let me tell you, there were a lot more. But when he said each of you, some of them still didn't want to. But you know what? Salvation is for everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, the world that he gave his son, that whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's why Jesus came, to have eternal life. 
This very word that Peter used here in the, in, in the Greek was a word, in, and I think it's up there, is metanoia. Now this word metanoia means this. When Jesus says repent, when Paul says repent, he's saying this, change your purpose. You're on a purpose of something in life. But what he's saying is you can't continually in a wrongful purpose. You need to turn around. The second point of that meaning of that word, when the Bible talks about repent, he's saying a complete change in direction of 180 degrees to go in the opposite way. That's what it means to repent. So, so if I'm going like this, and, I'm, and I did this, and I lived this life, lekker of onbeskof, I met Jesus in my life, 49 years ago, no gaan, eh? 49 years ago, and I turned around, and I followed Jesus. Has it been easy? Absolutely not. Has it been stressful? Yeah, yeah many times. Have I sinned in the meantime? Oh, oh, oh. Tonight I've got good news for you, for you sinners out there. I've got some good news for you. But it's a turning around and it's following Jesus. That's what metanoia means. Now, now my experience with many Christians, and I see them, they come to the church, they put up there and they want to receive Jesus, they come here, I pray for them. So what they do is they go like this. We want Jesus. <laughs> Have you noticed? We still go the same way, but we just want a little bit of your Jesus. It doesn't work like that. You've got to turn around. That's what repentance means. That's what omdraine because the person who's truly repentant is the person who forsakes their sin and turns and wants to follow Jesus. And it's a daily laying your life down before this wonderful Savior who strengthens you and helps you to walk victorious. Because admitting sin is no substitute for quitting sin. I just want to remind you. So Paul writes this to the Corinthians church. And it's very interesting that he had to write this because he saw a couple of fakes happening. Uh, 49 years in the ministry, I've seen a lot of fakes happening. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, listen to this. Godly sorrow brings repentance. And that repentance leads to salvation. And that salvation leaves no regret. Can I honest to God tell you this tonight as I stand here before you? 49 years ago, 1975, January, I gave my life to Jesus. I want to tell you, ever since I said yes to Jesus, when I thought I was a main manner, I had my life organized, there were a lot of things I was up to, which I would hate to share with you tonight. You'll think, really? <laughs> Should he be in the ministry? Let me tell you, 49 years, that scripture that says, it brings with it no reg I've never regretted a day in my life that I met Jesus. And I know there's a whole crowd of witnesses that can honest to God say that today. Because something happens in your life when the King of Glory takes hold of you. What is he saying here? Godly sorrow brings repentance. We're talking about repentance tonight. Godly, God, I'm so sorry. I'm a sinner. Romans 6, uh, 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God's not here to judge you and beat you because you're a sinner. He's made a way for you to change your life. That's why he came. So, so now we stand over here and, and we, <laughs> we get to God and, and he says, Godly sorrow brings repentance and leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But listen to the other one. He says, but worldly sorrow brings death. And on the word, you read here a stop straat. And the policeman trekt you over. Now you know you're outgefangen. That's not godly sorrow. That's oh, meneer, ek, ek is haastig. My oma lay op sterven. And ek, ek weet, you know, lig jy ook soke lekker by die policeman. En ek krij jou jammer, hy sê, yes, bro, maar moet dit nie doen. Meneer, ek sal dit nooit weer doen. Jy draai om jou hoek en jy gaan dier drie ander stofstraten en jy rai weer vannacht. You know what? That's worldly sorrow. You only sorry, why? Because you've been caught out. Many people hear the message of what I'm preaching tonight and they say, yes, I need to change. But that's worldly sorrow because you know what's going to happen. You're not going to change and you're going to remain in death. Jesus died to take us out of death to bring us into life, to take us out of darkness to bring us into light. So godly sorrow leads to repentance, but worldly sorrow, ach, ek is jammer, jere, jy weet maar, maar jy verander nie. Because what did I say? Admitting sin is no substitute for quitting that stuff. Amen. You cannot be a born-again Christian, saved or converted, listen to me, without 
genuine, echte bekering, genuine repentance. Because godly sorrow leads to, Jere, ek kan nie meer aangaan soos ek gaan nie. My life's got to change. And I want to serve you. The moment you do that, man, your life will change forever. Forever. Do you know what God's heart, Peter writes to the church in, in, in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, and he says these beautiful words. He says, the Lord does not delay and he's not tardy and slow about what he promises. Promises to look after you. Promises to bless you. Promises to give you an abundant life. Promises that he's coming one day. Now listen to this. According to some people's conception of slowness. People say, oh, God said 2,000 years ago he's coming. Oh, where is he? You know? Let's just carry on. The Bible says, yeah, just carry on drinking and whining and, and carrying on what the Bible says. And not worrying until the trumpet sounds and it's the light. Mm. Okay. I was going to say something else here, but I've got to stick to this. He says, God's conception of slowness. People think it's slow. But listen to this. But he, God, is long-suffering. He's extraordinarily patient towards who? Towards you and me. Why? Because he's not desiring that any should perish, but that all should turn to what church? Turn to repentance. What is on God's heart for every single one of you breathing, beautiful people sitting here tonight? He wants you to come to him in repentance. That's his heart for you and I. You know, in Acts uh, 17.30, Paul says this to the church. Because in the past, they, they, they brushed it over and they thought, Ach, it's not it's not belangrijk nie, and, and jy praat nie, and you're just religious. Listen to this, Acts 17.30. In the past, God overlooked such an ignorance. He overlooked it when you wanted to be ignorant and not take it in. But listen to this now. But now, he commands all people everywhere to what? Repent. That's God's command. If you want to walk with Jesus, you've got to repent. You've got to ask God to forgive you, to have a relationship with him. In Mark 11, uh, Mark 1 verse 14 and 15, in the beginning of the letter, Mark writes about Jesus. He says, now after John was arrested and put into prison, this John the Baptist that came as a forerunner to warn them that Jesus is coming. Jesus then comes into Galilee preaching the good news. What was the good news? The gospel of the kingdom. You see, when you give your life to Jesus and you repent, you come from darkness into light. You come from death into life. You become a citizen of a kingdom of where the king of glory is the king. You become a son and a daughter in the kingdom. That's the message. You might walk around in this little body and dress it up and, and mooi. Maar in your heart is your koningskind. So Jesus came to preach the kingdom of God is at hand for those that will want to follow Jesus will come into the new kingdom and be kingdom people. So what did he say? And saying the time has been fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And listen to what he says. How do you get into the kingdom? Repent, have a change of mind which issues in regret. Yamrta, or forgiveness of your past sins. And then you need to change your conduct for the better. And you need to believe the good news of the gospel. G-O-S-P-E-L. You know what that stands for? God offers saved people eternal life. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And that's what Jesus has asked us to do, to come. Paul, in his, in his ministry, while I was doing the research on this, he speaks a lot about repentance. In Acts 26, 20, the B portion there, he says, I preached, listen what he did, he preached to the people that they should repent and turn to God. And here's the key. And prove their repentance by their deeds. When he say, you can't hear any, but you live in the devil himself. Huh? That's what he's saying. So the point of the matter is, yeah, many Christians are under the wrong impression. And this is it, two things. Repentance is only for the lost and the unsaved. And boy, have I got news for you. Repentance must be a daily exercise for each and every Christian. Cake. If there's one oak that's repented more than I can tell you, it's me. Why? Because I can. And you see, it's like I said, admitting sins, there's no substitute for, for quitting them. There are things we do, things we say, things we, we, we're not happy with in our life, but we do them, but we're children of God. Thank God for that wonderful word that he gave us called repentance. Amen. Praise God. 
I want to talk to you tonight about the blessing of repentance. Want dat is een sien in bekering. Nee. Nee, dochter, een sien in, jylle verstaan het, nee. Because I tell you what, the problem of the church today, two things. First one, it's easy to point at the faults of others and their mistakes, but very slow to examine ourselves. And secondly, we're quick to judge others, but we're slow to repent ourselves. Isn't that always amazing? I find it really amazing. When Oaks that don't know Jesus will come to me and they would say, Die see him all over you. Yes, I live as first. I don't know who be it, who I must live. Huh? He's judged the oak, but he's not willing to walk that journey. Can you see the irony and the hypocrisy? <laughs> it's crazy. And I've said this before, yeah. You know, many people say, yes, there's a lot of hypocrites in your church. I say, no, absolutely. I'm the pastor. I'm the, I'm the main hypocrite here. I said, but the difference between you and me is we're trying to become less hypocritical. So don't come to our church. We don't want another hypocrite here. Hallelujah. Revelation 2.5 says, and this is Jesus speaking, and he has a warning. He says, look how far you have fallen. And he's talking to somebody that came to Jesus, that lived for the Lord, but then he got a little bit wayward and he stopped serving the Lord and he allowed the worldly Filth to fill his life again and he's not living where he should. And he has the warning to people like that tonight sitting here. He says, look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me, God says, and do works that you did at first when you loved me and you walked with me. Get back there, man. Come now. That's what he's saying. But listen to this. If you don't do what, church? Repent. If you don't repent, how do you come back? You repent. God, I'm sorry. When the prodigal son was there eating cucumbers, he thought, I can't even eat it. I Papa. But he repented. He came to himself. That's what it means. Godly sorrow helps you to come to yourself. And what do you do? You repent. You ask Jesus to forgive you. And you begin to journey with the Lord. Hallelujah. And it's so exciting to do that. Because no repentance, there can be no revival. In anyone's heart. That's why Christians need to repent daily. As well as the unsaved need to be repent. To come into the kingdom of God. Without repentance there's no forgiveness. Without repentance there's no freedom. Without repentance there is no blessing. Because victory lies on the other side of repentance. Hello. Unconfessed sin is unforgiven sin. Who can do for you? It's, it's, it's a practice with me. When I honor God, when I worship God, and I praise Him, when I come into His presence, when I'm spending time with the Lord every day. Every day I love it. Talk to my daddy. Somebody said to me, how do you know God's alive? I said, no, I know. I spoke to him a few minutes ago. But, and I talk to God, and then I say, God, please forgive me for doing anything that upset you and help me to walk better with you. As David said of his sin, we're going to talk about him now. But, but create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit in me. That's what a desire. We're going to talk about that attitude of this dude now. The question is, why was David a man after the heart of God? And I'll tell you why. Because he was a man who understood what it was to repent of his sins. So let me just give you a little background of the dude we're talking about. So in case you thought you've messed up a little bit in life, compare your mess up with this mess up. And don't think you hear about David's mess up, you think, oh, so I wasn't so bad, so I don't need to repent. No, 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 no. All have sinned. Everybody needs to repent to come to God. Okay, we're on that page. So yes, David, when kings go to war, the Bible says, oh, Davy, I think it's not recorded, but he has George's version. He'd already looked over the balcony and they saw he read Boki on almost Batsheba, Batsheba Psalm. <laughs> and now Yorks go to war, go to war. When they were all gone to war, and there Bathsheba was bathing. Man, and he thought, this is a lekker goose, this one. Eh? <laughs> How do I get hold of her? And he marked schemes and planner. Anybody know that? Put up your hand. To, no, 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 kidding, only kidding. Don't put up your hand for heaven's sake. So he checks there and he goes and organizes and he gets her up in his room. And you know what happened, eh? They ate olives all night. (laughs) 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 
and he makes her pregnant. He didn't believe in the stalk, but something happened. <laughs> and he makes her pregnant. And now he's in a, in a bad place because he's now trapped to lane. He's now let the side down. He's the king, and he set the worst example. So now he knows she's got a husband. His name is Uriah. <laughs> Maybe that's where Uriah Heep came from. <laughs> Remember that one, eh? Loved their music too. But so, so Uriah's the do something. So you know what he does? He calls in his, his general and he says to him, listen, when this out comes, man, go send him to his wife. Let her go and eat olives with his wife. <laughs> but this out is such an admirable, honest guy. He says, he says to, to the general, he says, no, 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 no. I can't do that. My men have come back from war and we're about to go on to war tomorrow again. We, I, I need to sleep with them. I need to stand with them. I need to motivate them. What kind of a dude is Uriah? What an upright citizen. So he doesn't go sleep with her. So now David was hoping if he went to sleep with her when he came back now, that we can say, hey, it's your kind. It's not my kind. You can see the licht. Now, this dude doesn't do this. So he thinks, yeah, no, hell, this honest act, we better send him to the battlefield. So he says to the kings, uh, to his, his, uh, his managers or his leaders or his generals or whatever, he says, guys, when you're going into battle and the enemy comes, retreat your men a little bit further so that they can kill him. And what does he do? He gets Uriah killed. Zik, claw. And Uriah sleeps with his wife, makes her pregnant, lies to the guy, and then he kills him. Now you tell me, how does God handle that? Can I say this to you? God doesn't handle that. That is evil in the sight of God. But I want to give you hope tonight out of David's life that no matter what you did, no matter how gross it is, no matter how bad it is, no matter how terrible it is that you've done, I want to tell you, God has given you a beautiful key and it's called repentance. His blood flowed from that cross to wash us who was red as crimson to make us white as wool, says Isaiah. It's such a beautiful message of God. I want us to take a journey now through 11 verses, and I'm going to be as quick as I can be. But this is the most beautiful message from David. Psalm 32 is the most beautiful message of David's life and how he experienced God and how God restored him and how God renewed his life. Now listen to this. Let's just go straight away. Psalm 32 verse 1, he says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered up. Blessed is the man who's thrown to Whatever he did, David, you know what he did? He says, you know what? When God forgives you, let me tell you, I don't deserve it. It's grace. But blessed is the man when God has said, my son, I forgive you. Listen, that is the most beautiful thing you can ever hear in your life. Let me tell you something tonight. He didn't say, blessed is he who never sins. No, no. He said, he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. In other words, every one of us are sinners. But when you've come to God in repentance, ask him to forgive you. Let me tell you, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. You know what the devil does? He keeps reminding you about your sins and your past. Eh? Just remind him about his future a little bit. Hey, hey, you can look in hell there. can you to... But Jesus said, may forgive him and stop reminding me of your rubbish. But it's so beautiful. God will have that we, that we don't sin. But the, the point of the matter is if we do sin, he wants us to repent to receive his forgiveness. It's so beautiful the way David says it. Verse 2, blessed again, he says, is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit, man. Blessed is the one whose, whose sin the Lord does not count. Did David mess up? Absolutely. But he can write now that God has forgiven me. I love it when Paul, I think it's 1 Corinthians 10, 1. He says, take us into your hearts, brothers, while he's writing to the Corinthians church. And he says, take us into your hearts. We harmed no man, we hurt no man. Absolutely. Paul was standing there when they put Stephen's cloak over his arm and they were stoning Stephen. They weren't stoning, they were going with Lippa and they stoned Stephen and, and he was part and parcel to the uh, um, complicit to, to Stephen's death but he, he understood what it meant to repent, to ask God to forgive him for the, for the way in which he lived before he met the Lord Jesus Christ 
God's forgiveness. You look at so many passages in the Bible where God had come and he had forgiven. 1 John 1 verse 9. One of my most beautiful scriptures of a promise to every child of God. Listen to this. If we freely, and here's the word repent, admit that we have sinned. You need to admit it. Say admit it. You can't, you can't not admit that you're a sinner because if you don't think that you're a sinner and you're okay, well, let me tell you, you mark yourself recht for die bederf. Does that rhyme? <laughs> Sounded good. But the fact of the matter is you're preparing yourself for an eternity without God. It's a place called hell. It's not a lack of place to want to go to. Eh? He says, if we freely admit that we have sinned and we confess those sins, that's repentance. You know what happens? God is faithful and he's just and he's true to his own nature and promises. He will forgive your sins, dismiss your lawlessness, and listen, continually cleanse us from all unrighteousness, anything that's not in right standing with him. He'll cleanse that. Everything, not in conformity to his will, purpose, thought, and action. What a, what a wonderful freedom we have under the blood of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful promise that anybody has the freedom to be able to come to God. One thing I've learned about God, he doesn't hold a stick over your head. He doesn't remind you of your failures and your mess ups. Because the moment you've asked him to forgive you, you know what he does? He forgives you. He gives you a brand new start. So if you come to him tomorrow morning and say, Lord, do you remember that sin? He'll say, which one? Oh, forget it. <laughs> because he forgets. He throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. He chooses to forget it because he sees the price that his son paid for your sins and for my sins. You see, a repentant heart will never want to allow deceit into his heart. And deceit is just dishonesty and unfaithfulness. He wouldn't want that. And then verse 3, and we're carrying on. When I kept silent, and this is so important, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Let me tell you, refusing to repent will drag you down. When he says, my bones wasted away, what is he simply saying this is my body. And I want to say that, and I see that in people's lives. You don't repent. You're trying to fix up your life by yourself. And the devil has got a hold of you, and he's playing with you like a rag doll. The answer is get to Jesus so he can deliver you. Because I've seen people carrying forgiveness, unforgiveness, bitterness, negativity, hardship. They're sick. You know, I don't want, I don't, let me not say it. Okay. The, people are carrying diseases and sicknesses in their bodies. There's heart problems because we carry stuff in our lives. And all God's saying to you, man, the easiest way out to have victory, to feel free, to not feel like David said when I was silent, when he didn't tell the Lord about his bad stuff and he tried to silence it and he tried to kill the husband and all of that, he was as sick as anything. And that's the problem with us. You see, we, we become so sick. That's why repentance is important every day. To come to God in all honesty. And I've said it how many times. When you come to God and you say, Lord, you know that, that thing I stole from the work. God's not going to say, which one was that? <laughs> he already knows you stole it, man. But he wants you to come to him and ask him to forgive us. And walk in his forgiveness and walk in his love. Because you won't experience spiritual renewal. Acts 3 verse 19 says this. Now repent. Change your mind, your attitude to God and turn to him so he can cleanse away your sins and send you. Listen to this. And send you and send you and send you wonderful times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. When I've laid my sin before God and I've been honest and I accept him as my savior, he sends me times of great refreshing. There's no greater place to be when your sins are forgiven. Even if you mess up tomorrow, ask God to forgive you. Do not do it deliberately or willfully. Admitting your sins is no substitute for quitting them. We need to quit them. We need to walk in, in, in God's goodness. Just because God shows grace, you can't just carry on with the same stuff over and over. Now, you do understand that. Verse 4. For day and night your hand was heavy on me and my strength was sapped 
as, as like in the heat. You know when we have like a real warm Cape Town 45 degree heat, you can look to you need air and air condition of air. Well, well, he says, you know, when I was in the sinful place and I knew my life was in a mess, it felt like this heat just drinking me and I can't do anything. Let me tell you, you don't have to carry any more loads off to tonight. You just bring it to Jesus and bring yourself and say, God, deliver me. And, and something new will happen in your heart, in your life. Amen. The conviction of the Holy Spirit can be weighty and it can be powerful. And why does God do that? Why does he let that heaviness come on you? You know why? Because he smokes you so much. He doesn't want you to stay the way you are. So he wants you to change. So he'll discipline you. Amen. And he will. He'll send you wonderful times of refreshing. Verse 4. And day and night, he says, he was heavy upon me. The Revelation 3.19 says, those who I dearly love, says God, I tell them their faults and I convict them and I convince them and I reprove them and I chasten them. I discipline and I instruct them. So be enthusiastic and earnest and burning with zeal and listen to this and repent, changing your mind and your attitude. That's what God wants, to come to him in repentance. Ask him to change your life. You know, I, I was thinking when I wrote that, I thought of myself, when you sense you're in a dry place, repentance brings water into your desert. That's the beauty of what God does. I just want to say two things tonight. Romans uh, 8 verse 1 says, There is no more condemnation for them that are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that have repented and asked Christ to come in their life. There's no, more, there's no more condemnation. You see, there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. God convicts, as we read that in the scripture, he convicts us of our sins. The, the devil comes and he condemns you because of your sin. Condemn means it's, you get the rejection, you feel guilt, you feel shame, you feel despair. But you see, when conviction comes, and that's how you'll know it's God and not the devil, it will prompt you to desire to want to change. You will begin to take responsibility. It will lead you most naturally to repentance. That's conviction. But condemnation brings you to a place where you, where you feel bad. And even if you've asked God to forgive you, you just feel, how can God forgive me for this bad stuff that I did? Well, let me just tell you, he did. In a state that you geloof, in, in actie sit in a bieke geloof in jou leven. He's not holding it against you. If you've genuinely asked him, godly sorrow leads to repentance. Is exactly what we said here. Verse 5, and I'm, I'm rushing here. Verse 5. Then, listen to this. I acknowledge my sin. Notice the depression, the heaviness, the hardship. And then it comes to this place. And he's saying, I acknowledge my sin. Here, I brought it before you. I was honest with you. And I did not cover up my iniquity. Then I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you will forgive, listen to the word, the guilt of my sin. You see, every morning David woke up. He didn't have to say, oh, I really screwed up. Eh? He could go and face Uriah's family and ask them to forgive him. Eh? Hello. They, he killed their son. <laughs> what about his kids? David killed him, killed the dad. He could, he could come to them with an open heart and say, forgive me, because God's forgiven me. Isn't that beautiful? Just such a liberating, wonderful thing about our Heavenly Father. Listen, this needs to be the cry of every child of God. The genuine heart of repentance. Listen then, Isaiah pops in with this beautiful little humdinger here, and listen to what God says. This is God speaking. I even I, God, says, He, I am He who blots out your sins for my own sake, and I will never think of them again. Listen, tonight I hope you're hearing hope. <laughs> Verse 6, and we're carrying on. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You see, repentance is for every child of God who, who believes in God. We've got to pray continue. We've got to repent continue. We've got to keep cleansing the temple of God while the door of grace is still wide open. You see, you'll sit here tonight and you'll say, yeah, I'll do it tomorrow or next week. I first want to draw a little bit here. I thought those thoughts, believe me, so I don't judge you for thinking those thoughts. 
And then I never made my life right with God. Thank God he didn't take me or I didn't have an accident or drive over something or into something. I did drive a lot into stuff, but God, God delivered me. But the point of the matter is, today is the day of salvation. Today is the choice. We don't know what tomorrow will be. And he tells us over here to watch out, to watch out. Because he says, while he may be found. Why he may be found. And, and verse 7 says, you are my hiding place. Notice how good it's becoming now. He, he says, you faithful, surely the rising of the mighty waters won't touch me because I, I did it in time. And then he t- turns around, verse 7, he says, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and you will surround me with songs of deliverance. And can I say, when you've repented and you've given your heart to the Lord, God puts a garrison around you, man. Isaiah 4, verse 6 and 7, but verse 6 says, be anxious for nothing but pray about everything and ask God with specific requests. And then the God of strength will come and he'll garrison around you. He'll bring his angels to guard you, to protect your mind and your heart. You can trust him. And that's exactly what he's saying here. God, you're my hiding place. You're my stronghold. That's why we we need to habitually repent. And we need to judge our life, our sins, and our conduct. So God remains our hiding place. Because what you do then is you remove the enemy's stronghold and leave a clean house for God to live in. That's so important that we do that. Verse 8, I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way that you should go and I will counsel you with my loving eye upon you. Notice, David has been speaking from verse 1 to verse 7. He's been speaking to God. He's been talking about his repentance. He's been talking about the positivity, about what happens when I do. And then verse 8, notice this, God begins to speak. And this is so beautiful. God speaks to him. And isn't it amazing how clearly we begin to hear the voice of God's guidance when we have a clear channel with God. Amen. Cleaned by repentance. We hear the voice of God. You want to hear the voice of God in your life? Ask God to forgive you and walk with Jesus. Verse 9. Do not. (laughs) Listen. Here is no for once. Don't be like a horse or a mule. Nah. In, in biking terms, don't be a Hayabusa or a Kawasaki. <laughs> oh, geez, I had to do that. Eh? Only kidding, because we've got a guest here tonight with a very nice thousand kawa. Well done, Boyki. I don't know where you're sitting, but there's it. I told you, eh, we have one another on, I warned you. So, feel it home here by us. He says, don't be like a horse or a mule which have no understanding but must be controlled by a bit or a bridle or they will not come to you. I think tonight some of you are sitting here and your president said we're going to church and you've come here. Heel marks all the way. (laughs) Stop being stubborn. Stop having a stubborn heart is what he's saying here. God is saying, don't be like a horse or a mule that doesn't have understanding. What is he saying is don't be stubborn because it's, it's a form of rebellion. We're rebelling against God when we're stubborn and we don't want to. We must be so careful that, that, that we're not slow to repent because God will put a, put a bit in your mouth. Listen to this, Proverbs 26 verse 3. It's beautiful. He says, a whip for a horse and a bridle for a donkey and a rod for a fool's back. <laughs> don't be a fool. Repent. Ask God to follow you. Otherwise, he might have to sort you out. Verse 10, and we're getting close to the end here. Listen, many are the woes of the wicked. So true. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. And have I seen that in life from the time I gave my life to Jesus? And I look at people and I see they go through hardships and I see they go through difficulties and and they don't know how to handle it. They fall apart. But you see, when you come to Jesus and you repent, and you give your heart to him, and you live for him. Man, I tell you, there's no woes. The Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. God is for you. God is for you. God is full of mercy. He's more ready to forgive our sins than what we are actually willing to repent of our sins. You see that? Repentance is the way we access his mercy. Repentance is the way we access his forgiveness. You know, when I wrote that, this thought came into my mind. The very presence and existence 
of CMA, Christian Motorcycles Association, running now 48 years worldwide in almost every country in the world, even in Russia. Now, let me just say this. We're not here to talk about ourselves. We have one mission, to win motorcyclists, their family, and their friends to the Lord Jesus. We are dealers in hope. That's why we exist. We don't exist for anything else. We're here to serve the people, to tell them about this Jesus, and to tell them you need to repent, and you need to change your heart, and you need to follow Jesus. That is the reason this ministry exists. Why? Because it wasn't a man idea, it was a God idea, this ministry. And it stood through thick and thin, through troubles and strife, but CMA is still going. There's many Christian clubs around, and God bless them for the wonderful work that they do. Obviously, we're looking at our ministry. God has given us a divine calling. We have a vision and a mission, and that's why we stand here today. And I want to close off with verse 11. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad you righteous. Sing, all of you who are upright in heart. Can you see repentance is very clear what David is saying. It brings joy. It brings blessing. It brings peace. It unleashes the fruit of the Spirit. Kindness, gentleness, love, kindness, all of the good stuff. Generosity comes from a person that has encountered God, the person that walks with God. The, your life is different. You cannot be the same again. Uh, same again. That, that the Bible says, it says, Godly sorrow reaches to repentance and brings salvation and leaves with it no regret. I can honest to say that to you tonight. It leaves no regret. The sad thing is that so many Christians don't think it's necessary to repent. And so they become stiff-necked. Are you stiff-necked, yes or not? Huh? Thy neck if I knew what you I will rock now. Listen to this scripture. Just so you get put back in your stiff-necked place. Proverbs 29 verse 1 says, A man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Repent. Ask God to forgive you. Ask Jesus to come into your life. Man. Repent. Repent. Luke 15, 7 is my closing scripture. And this is so beautiful because this is what happens when a person repents. He says, Thus I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one wicked person who repents, and then he explains what repents is, changes his mind, abhorring his errors and his misdeeds, and determines to enter upon a better course of life. Can I make it more plain than that? You want to know what it is to follow Jesus? Here it is. Change your mind, abhor your errors and your misdeeds, and determine to enter upon a better course of life. Listen, Jesus says it will be better than for, for the 99 righteous people who have no need for repentance. Because there's a lot of people who say, I don't need repentance. And the world is full of them. Full of the anti-gods. <laughs> Atheists, heathens, whatever you want to call them. But you see what the Bible says over here very, very clearly. That there's joy in heaven over one. Just the one sheep. Not the 99 who are righteous I don't need to change. I'm, I'm doing good enough here. None of us do good enough. Please believe me. None of us can stand before the King of glory except if we've come through our Lord Jesus Christ and live for him. I close off with a statement. Jesus will not be Savior without your behavior. And if you're allowed him to be Savior, you'll change your behavior. You want God to change your behavior. Tonight we can give you that opportunity. And that's the joy of this. Come let us just bow our heads in prayer. As we come before the Lord. Father I thank you tonight for your word. Your word that is spoken to us. Not my word. Not my slim ideas here Lord. It's your word that spoke to us tonight. The Holy Spirit. I just want to ask tonight while we're seated here. And our heads are bowed. This is wonderful privilege that we can come to that place. If you're sitting here tonight and you say, 
I need to repent. I need to change. I want to follow this Jesus you spoke about. I want to walk in the fullness and joy of the Lord. I'm sick and tired of having this heavy, oppressed lifestyle of mine. If that is you, we're not going to call you to come to the front. I'm going to ask you just to stand up in your chair right now. And we would like to pray for you. If that is you now, I want you to stand. Don't wait for people. Just stand and say, Lord, here I am. I'm with you, Jesus. I really need you, Lord. If you really need the Lord tonight, don't, it, don't worry about your, your family, your friends, your biking buddies. They're not going to help you. One day you'll stand before Jesus, just you and Jesus. Just you and Jesus. If you want to make a commitment tonight and say, Lord, here I am. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. And I would trust tonight as you're standing that something in your heart has been stirred through this message. And this is a message from the Holy Spirit to your heart. So if you stirred to, to make a choice and say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to repent. Then I want you to stand right now. Don't wait for people to, to first uh, wonder what they're going to think about you. The Bible says, if you confess me before people, I will confess you before the Father. It's got his calm, isn't it? Wonderful Jesus. Father, you see each of these precious people standing before you. And this is the certainty that I have tonight that not one of them that are standing before you right now, that you don't know what is going on in their hearts right now. And I pray, Father, that your godly conviction will come upon each one of us. And that you would draw us back into a beautiful relationship with your son, Jesus. That we can know tonight, Lord, if we confess our sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive us. And not only forgive us, to cleanse us of our past sins. To receive you as Lord and Savior. To know that our past is exactly what it is in the past. We thank you, Lord, that our future is bright. Our future is positive. Our future, our future is exciting because we're walking from tonight with Jesus. I want to cut off, Lord, negativity that was spoken over people's lives here tonight. Whatever the enemy had meant for harm, Father, I rebuke him in Jesus' name. And I pray for a freedom to come over the hearts of your people. I want to pray, Father, that people will know that your word says if we believe in our hearts that Jesus died. And that he was buried and that he rose again and he's alive. Your word says we will be saved if we believe it. And we think of Peter's word, Lord, when they asked, what must we do? And you said, repent, be baptized, and you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray for a freedom to come upon each one that is standing. And even for those that are sitting, that should be standing, that knows in their hearts their lives need to change. Father, that they will not delay for any length of time. Because as the word says, there'll come a time when it's too late. And we don't want to ever reach a place where it's too late. Thank you for your grace, for your love, your mercy. We bless and honor you for that, Father. We thank you for hope in every life right now. I pray for faith to arise in every life. To know tonight that you've forgiven us. And you give us a fresh new start. And that times of refreshing, according to your word, will come into each of these lives. In Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. God bless you. I, um, I just want to say, if there's anybody that would, would need prayer after the service is closed, you want to come forward here for prayer, we uh, and our team, CMA guys are here. Just stand ready, CMA team. Maybe you want to come stand up front here in the beginning. Maybe there's just somebody that would like to just, just have a prayer. And that's so wonderful. And we do that with pleasure. Amen. Praise God. I hope you heard something tonight. I hope you've been encouraged. It wasn't to discourage you. It was to encourage you. The devil disconnects you from courage. Discourage. Okay. Amen. Praise God. May we go this week in the full freedom that God has given us. Let's be quick to repent, amen, and let us walk with Jesus in this wonderful light and way that he has laid before us. 
not carrying burdens anymore. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, I think it's 7 or 8, 7, he says, cast your burdens on me because I care for you. What a privilege. Let us do it. Let's be faithful. Let's be biblical. Amen. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for your saving grace tonight. We thank you for the privilege that you've given us as your human, this world. You've given us this thing called repentance, metanoia, to change. Lord, may we in this week be, be conscious of our lives before you. And whatever we need to change, help us to change it. That we might live for the better as your word says we should. Thank you for each one that has come up. I pray your blessing, your favor, and may this be a glorious, victorious, overcoming, God-blessed, provided for week in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen.